Uh, people can hear me okay? Okay, so uh, let me get a quick sense of the audience here. Uh, I, I'm looking, everybody looks like a student. So who is not a student here? Okay. <coughs> About six or so people. Okay, good. Uh, um, how many people have heard a talk on power management before? One, two, three, four. Okay, five. And how many people have done a project on power management before? Okay, so that, that's going to be the goal of my talk. So I'm going to try and at the end of the talk get you guys all excited about this area and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you guys will invite me over in a couple of years. And when I come here, I want to see a lot more hands uh, in terms of people uh, who are aware of power management, people who are working on power management. Okay? Okay, so basically what are we trying to do here? The uh, talk ca is called uh, Saving the World One Server at a Time. And then the first thing people ask me is like, what's with the title, right? And then, so this was basically inspired by a cartoon I saw a while back. And it talks about whenever I learn a new skill, I concoct elaborate fantasy scenarios where it helps me uh, save the day. And then this particular cartoon is about regular expressions and searching through data. But you could pretty much replace it with uh, global warming as the problem. And I know energy efficient designs. And, 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 and so that's kind of going to be the metaphor for this whole talk. And, uh, my six-year-old son and I spent a lot of time doing research for this talk, and we figured a typical superhero episode has the following outline. <coughs> so you kind of introduce the characters, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. There's going to be some catastrophic failure of some kind. There's going to be the Earth is going to be destroyed, and I'm going to be talking about exactly how that matches for us. And then we're going to talk about how uh, computer scientists are going to save the world. And really, there are going to be two themes to the uh, answer that I'm going to talk about, and it's in these key uh, keywords here. The first one has to do with systematic. And I'm going to talk about how it's very important to systematically understand uh, the problem of power management and kind of understand the principles of power management. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And the second is this nice-sounding word, holistic. And I'm going to talk about how you want to look at power management across the overall problem, not just look at one piece at a time, but really look at the uh, uh, overall problem. Then. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, so. Let's start with the uh, introduction of the alter ego. Every superhero has to have one. And uh, given that it's a pretty youngish audience, I decided I'd dispense with the standard PowerPoint way of introducing myself. And I went to YouTube and I did a search for my name. And I'm going to show you the first video that comes up for my name. Okay. My name is Parthar Ramanathan. I'm a principal research scientist at Sixty Lab. My recent research focuses on system architecture for energy efficiency. Why energy efficiency? Well, energy is becoming a key problem across the spectrum of computing devices, from the smallest handheld to the largest enterprise server. This problem affects you, the end user, in terms of battery life for consumers, electricity costs for servers, reliability and thermal issues, and finally, environmental implications like global warming. Our research seeks to address these problems holistically at all levels of the system, from chips to data centers. Specifically, we have developed several new technologies. Energy-aware user interfaces, where displays adapt their power consumption based on scope of user interest. This can improve display battery life two to ten fold. Asymmetric multi-core processors that match applications to processors of different speeds and sizes to save power. Ensemble blade power management that manages power budgets across a collection of servers to reduce provisioning costs. And finally, temperature aware resource schedulers that intermittently schedule applications sensitive to the cooling profile in the data center to bring down air conditioning costs by 50%. More details of our work can be found at this website. Okay. Wasn't that cool? I always like the penguin out of my pocket. So, uh, Okay, so that's really what I work on. I, I have a couple of different things I work on. Uh, I work on energy-aware computing, which is what the video was about. Uh, I also uh, do a lot of research on designing servers and data centers. Uh, and, in, and in today's talk, I'm going to take a little bit of both of this, and I'm going to talk about energy-efficient design of data centers. So that's really what we're going to do today. So what is the problem we are trying to solve, right? So obviously power management is a very important problem. You saw that in the video. Uh, anybody, I guess everybody has a cell phone right now, and everybody knows about battery life issues with cell phones, so we are all 
aware of that. Uh, in servers, it's all about electricity costs. It uh, takes a lot of money to power a, a Google-like data center, for example. The heat is pretty much a problem. There's all sorts of problems there. But when you look at uh, research, and, and I, I come from HP Labs, where we do research in terms of looking at uh, uh, inventing new things uh, in terms of improving power management, there's a huge body of work that's looked at power management, whether it's in the uh, low-level circuits that you make transistors and you make uh, systems out of, at the higher-level architecture or in terms of the software space. And so the question basically then is, well, if there's so much work done on power management, uh, uh, why should we be doing more? And the answer is, even though there's a lot of work on power management, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. And to kind of illustrate that point, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first one has to do with um, a paper from IBM from a while back, and it talks about the holy grail of mobile computing. Wouldn't it be nice if your cell phones ran on human-powered battery life, right? And so this talks about various body sources. You could kind of keep tapping your foot, and that generates about a few milliwatts here. Uh, you can have body heat, and that generates a few milliwatts here, right? And, and, and the point is there's a lot of different things. But the bigger point is that these are all in terms of milliwatts. And, and a typical handheld device takes hundreds of milliwatts, maybe even a watt, right? And, and if you're not a big fan of body heat as a way to power your cell phone, uh, let's look at something that we in California would be happy about, solar energy, right? 164 watts per square meter is basically the amount of solar energy that we get typically in Sonoma. And if you do the multiplication in terms of the efficiency of converting the solar, uh, in the heat into solar energy, and, and you do all the, this is basically a very small size solar panel, you get 10 milliwatts. So 10 milliwatts of power, and if you want to kind of think about the current devices, we are talking about hundreds of milliwatts here. So again, we have a long way to go before we can declare victory on power management, right? And this is in the handheld space. Let's look at the server <coughs> space. What I have here in this picture is kind of the evolution of how we've been designing servers. Long back, we used to have these racks of servers where we had different kinds of uh, uh, computers that uh, you used to kind of host your web services and so on. We went into a more uh, a streamlined design with pizza boxes, and, and, and this particular rack consumed about 16 kilowatts compared to, say, 8 kilowatts in the past. And then we went to something called blade servers. So how many people here have heard of blade servers? Good. So we went into blade servers, and then we started refining this further and further, so much so that we went from somewhere around 6 kilowatts to about 60 kilowatts. That's a factor of 10 increase in the amount of power that we have compressed in a small region of uh, the data center. And for that kind of compression, we are talking about air cooling no longer being effective. So you need to start having liquid cool systems in the data center. And again, uh, that's a problem. And then again, why is that a problem? Uh, if you look at, uh, this is basically each point represents a particular data center that I've visited in the last five years or so. And what is very interesting is that if you look at most data centers, they are in very, very, the amount of heat they can extract, the amount of cooling that you have in the data center is very small. And the, some of the best, more aggressive ones are around uh, uh, 10 to 10, 20 kilowatts per rack. But if you look at the previous picture where we talked about 55 kilowatts per rack, we don't have the current capacity in many data centers to be able to extract the heat out. Right? So that's a problem. And, and if that's not a big enough problem, the amount of money we spent <coughs> worldwide on power and cooling uh, last year was $40 billion. Right? That's a pretty big number. And, and so much so that uh, uh, in many companies, the amount of money that you pay on electricity for servers is more than the amount of money you pay to buy the server in the first place. And, and this is starting to be an important trend as well. And going beyond just the electricity cost, there are other implications of power and cooling that are starting to get more important. And one of the important uh, issues here is uh, uh, the reliability degradation. And so there is a uh, uh, very interesting paper from Uptime. There are other papers as well which talk about how the amount of uh, uh, degradation in the reliability, so your system degrades by a factor of two. The chances of failure of your system increases by a factor of two for every 10 degrees Celsius that you operate over a speed spot. So the, the hotter you make your system work, the more likely it's going to die. Right? We kind of know that. Uh, so all of this basically means that we need, now need to start thinking about power management, energy management as first order constraints in how we design systems. 
And then and this is kind of percolated down into the design. And if you look at how computer architects, how we design systems, it used to be very performance centric. And we have gone into a more energy efficiency centric metric of thinking about uh, designing system. And so what we have in this picture is time on the x-axis. We have a brown line, which is the number of transistors. And that's kind of doubling here, which is Moore's law. So how many people here haven't heard of Moore's law? Zero, good. So, and then, so that's the exponential growth here. Uh, if you look at the power budget, you can see that power has been increasing pretty dramatically. And somewhere in the last few years, it's kind of started stabilizing because people have realized this is a problem and we've hit the power ball. And you'll notice that performance, this is the single, uh, uh, single core clock frequency, and you can see that performance dipping because we are starting to hit power constraints before we get to performance, and we are starting to do multi-cores and so on. So we've started kind of thinking about uh, power as a first-class constraint. Right? But more recently, it's not just been about the power of the system. Uh, we've started thinking about something called the burdened cost of power. So what does burdened cost of power mean? So basically, there are two lines here. The line on the top is the amount of power consumed by a system, amount of heat that you generate from a server. <coughs> the line on the bottom is the amount of electricity that you spend in the supporting equipment surrounding the server. Right? So if you look at this extreme end, for every watt of electricity heat that your server generates, you spend an additional watt of power in the air conditioner, in the power delivery units, in all the supporting equipment surrounding that server. And, and so uh, we've kind of started realizing it's not just about the electricity, the power consumed by your system. It's what we call the burden cost of power. It's about the, uh, uh, electricity, the consequences of the electricity consumed <coughs> by your system, including uh, the other multipliers that come because you need to spend more energy to remove all of this heat as well. So we went from MIPS per watt, which is kind of performance per energy, to start thinking about performance per total energy consumed in the system. Right? But we are starting to find that's not enough too. Right? And so I'm going to show my second video here to illustrate that point. Uh, I'm going to warn you there's a lot of screaming in this video, so I'll give you the parental advisory. So if it's too scary, don't be scared. bet with George that uh, nobody's going to sleep in my lecture. So, and then I figured having videos of people screaming should do the trick. Uh, so uh, so we, we went away from energy efficiency to start thinking about this metric called sustainability, right? And that's what the video was saying. And if you think about sustainability, what, why, why is that a problem? 191 terawatt hours is the electricity used by servers in a few years. And that's the same amount of electricity to power all of Mexico a couple of years back. That's a huge amount of electricity. If you think about the carbon footprint of the IT industry, that's a pretty big amount as well. It's more than all the airline industry put together. But what is even more interesting is, even though this is, sounds like a big problem, what we are finding is that IT is only 2% of the total carbon emissions, and we are increasingly starting to use IT as a solution to address the remaining 98% of the carbon emissions. So the transportation industry spends a lot of uh, uh, carbon dioxide, and we are saying, well, maybe we should do more video conferencing to avoid all the carbon footprint of that, and we are starting to use more IT solutions. So increasingly, we are going to find that it's going to be important to start focusing on the sustainability, the uh, overall energy efficiency of IT, of computer science, to kind of start addressing these problems as well. And so that's really the high order bit. Is it's not about just energy efficiency. It's about sustainability as a first class constraint uh, in terms of designing systems. And, and so that was kind of the first part of the talk, where uh, uh, we basically said, well, here is the problem. And so uh, 
there's my Spider-Man reference. So I, I had to make sure I got all my son's favorite superheroes in there. So keep counting. There will be a quiz at the end. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the key thing is basically we're going to have to start rethinking the solution. Right? And there are really <coughs> two key themes that I want to talk about. The first one is we have to start thinking about what it means to uh, consider energy. What, is, what does energy mean? And then one of the things I'm going to talk about is it's no longer about just performance per energy. We need to really think about what this denominator means. What does sustainability mean? How do we measure sustainability? Right? And so the metric that we started looking at is something that we call supply side and demand side energy. So what does that mean? So basically, uh, okay, this is going to be my first of several questions here to make sure you guys don't go to sleep. So if you look at this particular laptop, okay, I have bucket A. Bucket A is the amount of energy you spend keeping this laptop operating at maximum power. I never turn the laptop off, and I never turn the laptop off for three years. The maximum energy spent by this laptop during its operation, that's bucket A. Okay? Bucket B is the amount of energy that I spend in making the laptop. The amount of energy in extracting the materials for that, in shipping the materials, in terms of manufacturing it, the supply chain, even recycling the laptop. That's bucket B. How many people think bucket A, the amount of energy to operate the laptop, is more than bucket B, the amount of energy to make the laptop? A bigger. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to say ten. Okay, how many people think B is bigger? Ooh. More than 10. Okay. So the right answer, this is one of those trick questions. So the correct answer is it's actually bucket A. Uh, and, and, and for this particular laptop, it turns out that the amount of energy that you consume in operating the laptop is actually more than the amount of energy in uh, uh, making the laptop. But what's happening is increasingly these two numbers are coming closer. And so for a lot of handheld devices, it's actually bucket B. The amount of energy in making the handheld device, your favorite iPad, iPhone, is actually more than the amount of energy in operating the iPhone. So when I'm starting to think about energy efficiency, we really want to be looking at both of these, the supply side and the demand side, and optimizing for those. Right? And so that's the first thing. So we need to be rethinking what we consider as energy to start thinking about supply side and demand side. So now in terms of second thing, we also need to start understanding energy holistically. And, 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 and if you look at this whole body of work that I talked about, everybody has done power management, it can be summarized in two words, right? Avoid waste. That's all there is to power management. So if there is one thing you take out of this whole class, power management is just about understanding where waste comes from and avoiding it, right? The tricky part is basically starting to figure out how we avoid waste. And then one of the things that we've done is basically come up with uh, a Avoiding waste, right there. Turn off electricity when you don't need it, right? And, and one of the things we have done is basically to start thinking about a framework to optimize uh, energy. And, and you can read about that in the uh, uh, communications of the ACM in April. And really what we try to do in this framework is to start thinking about where does waste come from? And we have a taxonomy of all the inefficiencies in the system. And then we started thinking about how do we reduce waste? And we came up with a taxonomy for uh, uh, how people have been addressing the various inefficiencies in the system. Right? So I'm not going to talk about the first part, which is where, uh, where does the inefficiencies come from. You guys can read the uh, article when it comes out. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time in kind of going through the top 10 ways in which we avoid waste uh, uh, once we get there. Okay. So let me see how many people can get at some of these answers. So uh, um, put your pens down. Take a minute to think about you're trying to optimize energy in your house. Your electricity bill is really high. And uh, you don't want to spend that much money. For some reason, you don't have that much money. Uh, so what would you do to start saving electricity in your house? And I'm going to need at least three answers before I move forward. And I'm between you and lunch. So. It's good to start coming up with answers. Okay. Turn off the heater. Turn off the heater, okay? Unplug devices that are not used. Okay, turn things off that are not being used. Oh, unplug them. Unplug them. Turn off all power strips. Okay, turn off all power strips. Okay, so there's a theme here, right? So we are basically starting to say, I, I'm going to look at something that I'm spending, I'm going to see where the waste is, and I'm going to start uh, uh, pulling things that I'm not looking at. You talked about things that are not being used. Uh, you talked about a heater, and potentially the heater could be used, and you're starting to trade off uh, money versus comfort, 
So there is a second theme there. Uh, anybody else? Uh, install solar panels on your roof. Solar panel, that's very good. So, uh, and that's basically a very interesting theme as well. So you're now starting to look at alternate technologies that are more energy efficient. Very good. Uh, buy new appliances. Buy new appliances. Okay, so refresh your appliances to be more energy efficient. Same theme. Insulate your house better. Insulate your house better. That's a very interesting theme. So if you start thinking about what you're doing with insulation, and you're going to get to that because not many people start talking about insulation in the first place, Insulation falls into this interesting category where you're spending energy to save energy. You're spending money to save money. You're basically going to go spend money to get some insulation, and you're kind of looking at some interesting things. And if you look at computer science, not many people are willing to take the risk of spending energy to save energy, but that's a very interesting theme. Anybody else? Go to bed early. I'm sorry? Go to bed early. Go to bed early. That's... Okay, I'm going to take some time to figure out what category that is, but that's good too. Okay, so here is my top ten list, right? So the first, I think we've talked about some of this. The first one is energy efficient technologies. And then in computer science, that means basically uh, you could think about a mechanical hard disk and you could replace it with solid state devices, flash sticks, for example. You could replace copper with optics, things of that kind. The second and third techniques are really about matching power to work. And what that means is uh, you kind of understand what you're trying to do and you try to spend as much power for that. If you're not using appliances, please turn them off, right? So how many people here have heard of energy proportionality? Okay, so, um, so we have the world's champion on energy proportionality sitting right there. Uh, your professor is, uh, uh, has that been announced yet? Uh, people told us, I don't know if it's up on the website yet. Okay, so, uh, so you're sitting in the room with the... Uh, uh, world's winner of the Joule sort metric on energy efficiency, right there. So, and so you should all know more about energy proportionality. But energy proportionality is all about basically turning your energy down to match what work you're doing. And, and you saw that uh, in, in some of the things we talked about. So the energy adaptive displays where I'm turning off portions of the screen uh, where, uh, that I focus on. The uh, dual of that is matching work to power, and again, you saw that in the video where I was taking my penguins, and I was saying there's heterogeneous uh, devices, and I want to match the work to the kind of device, right? So you have an uh, MBA manager, and you have an uh, engineer. You give the engineering jobs to the engineer and the management jobs to the manager, and that's more energy efficient in, in some respect, right? Things of that kind. Uh, there is this notion of piggybacking energy events, and uh, I was hoping many of you guys would say that. So you needed to go to the library, and you also needed to go and buy groceries, are you going to go spend uh, two trips and two, uh, two gallons of gas doing two trips, or are you going to try and piggyback energy events, right? So there's a bunch of things which happen in computer architecture as well. Shared caches is one example of that. Coalescing liquid streams is another example of that. Special purpose solutions are almost always a good way to win uh, energy. Uh, if you can have a specialized ASIC to do something that's better than a general purpose solution, so on and so forth. These five techniques are very common. If you can go back to a lot of the textbooks on power management, pick up a technique, you'll find that more likely it will fall into one of these. The next <coughs> part is where we are starting to find we are getting more emphasis on, and that's basically because we are squeezing out energy efficiency through the conventional ways. And one of them is to cross layers for efficiency. The video I showed about ensemble video management where I looked at a collection of systems and tried to optimize for that collection is very important. Same thing with trading off some other metric, right? I might choose to say I'm going to stay cold because I want to save more money on electricity. And then it's the same thing with fidelity aware energy management. I might say I'm going to get slightly lower quality video if it means I don't need to do a very complicated uh, MPEG coding algorithm that takes a lot of energy, so on and so forth. Uh, there's things around trading off the uncommon case. Nobody talked about spending somebody's power. I was at, uh, I was at a different school. Uh, so I, I teach a class on power management, uh, and it's a whole semester long. And I, I, I init initially used to have only six bullets here. And then as I teach, people would come up with new categories. And this was very interesting where, can I save my battery by stealing some cycles? And I'm like, I guess that's a good, if that's a reasonable power management technique. And you find that happening now where you start going to the cloud. Your handheld doesn't do a lot of computation. You go, uh, go, to, a go to some server back in the back end, and then you offload computation. So that's possible as well. And then spending power to save power. Again, I think we talked about that as well. Insulation is an example, but uh, uh, a, a garbage collection algorithm that compresses memory 
to reduce your memory footprint would be a computer science example of that, right? So again, the point here is there are some very intuitive ways in which you do that, and, you, and as you start applying these principles uh, to your computer science problem, you're going to find a lot of savings, right? And so what I'm going to show is how we systematically apply these principles, both at the supply and the demand side, and I'm going to talk about energy efficient server and data center design. And there are two key themes. I'm going to talk about co-design and uh, coordination. And, and what that means is basically I'm going to talk about how you want to design future systems as very efficient building blocks that are co-designed across hardware and software and, and configured as ensembles. What does all of that mean? So let's do a quick video here. So basically what you have is a, a blade server, a system which has processors, which has memory and so on. And what you start doing is to disassemble them, break them into various individual constituents where you can now start, this is your blade, and this is your processor, your memory, various components. And you can see that I'm going to start breaking this up into multi-cores, and I'm going to kind of build this into uh, very efficient uh, compute blades, memory blades, non-volatile storage, storage. And then I'm going to have software that starts combining these in various ways uh, uh, based on what you need to do with that. So you want to build a really big server, you combine them and build a big server. You want to build a, a Google-like web server with a lot of small things, you do that. right? And then, so what we have done is we have really started thinking about computer science as kind of like a game of Legos. I want to build the basic Lego pieces, and I'm going to spend a lot of time in making these Lego pieces very, very energy efficient. And then it's all going to be about the fun we have in uh, putting Legos together. So how many people like Legos here? Okay, I figured this analogy would work here. Uh, so and that's really what we're trying to do is we're not designing computing systems, but we're designing a flexible <coughs> compute substrate. And, and, uh, and the interesting part about this approach is that you can not only get power and sustainability, but it solves some of the other problems you face in data center design, whether it's around performance, uh, whether it's around the amount of sysadmins that you need to manage it in terms of costs and so on. Right? And so those are really the two mantras we have, co-design, disaggregation, you break things apart, coordinated ensembles. So at this point, most people kind of go like, really? That's a lot of big words there, so does this whole thing work? I'm going to show you that it does. Right? So the first example is something that we've been calling microblades and mega servers. And what we did is we went and looked at the cloud market. So uh, think of your favorite cloud provider, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Amazon. And we went and said, where does all the money go? And uh, what you can see from the picture is half the money goes for hardware, the other half of the money goes for power and cooling, which is what we talked about in the beginning. Power and cooling uh, is starting to uh, overtake hardware as the amount of money. And you'll also notice that there's really no big component. Maybe the processor jumps out. But you have to look at all of these pieces together. And that's the whole point about holistic design. You can't just focus on one component and hope to give a big dramatic difference. You need to really look at the whole system design. And so we did do that. And what we did was to come up with a new design for uh, blade servers for this kind of market, where we have this is a basic compute building block, the compute Lego block. And we kind of came up with this compute Lego block to use more energy efficient processors. Instead of using a really fat server processor, we used a bunch of thin uh, mobile processors. And that turns out to be significantly more energy efficient. We also came up with a new packaging solution where we said, I'm going to co-design the packaging and the system architecture. And what that means is we took a blade, that's, think of it as your motherboard on your uh, system. Uh, we took out the packaging on the uh, individual, uh, uh, so we had a naked package on the processor. We put a sheet of aluminum, and that's what this picture shows here. We have an aluminum plate next to the blade. And then we made another blade, another aluminum plate, another blade, so kind of like a, um, I don't know, Big Mac sandwich with a lot of layers going on. And, and what we've done by that is we've aggregated the heat. So when the heat comes out, aluminum is a really good conductor, and we've taken all the heat up, and then we have an aggregated heat sink that extracts all the heat. And remember one of the principles I talked about, number six, was you try to do things at the ensemble, at, across a collection of systems. And any time you do things across a collection, that's almost always more efficient than just doing one at a time. And what we have done is taken all the heat extraction and, and kind of combined it across that ensemble. And what that does is the burden costs of power <coughs> cooling. Remember the one watt for every one watt we spend? That comes down significantly. So instead of spending one watt for every one watt, I now spend only half a watt for every one watt. And that's pretty important. Uh, there's another thing that we do in terms of creating a new building block called a memory blade, and I'm not going to go into more detail on that. But the good news is when you put all of these things together, so you can see we have the classic um, web search, uh, your favorite Gmail, you, uh, Hotmail, 
YouTube-like workloads, MapReduce, basically doing computation uh, on the cloud. And what you can see is the improvement in performance for a given cost. So for a single dollar, how much performance do I get? And what you can see is that the improvement is anywhere from 200% to 600%. And on, on average, it's about a factor of two. So what you've done is for the same amount of money, we've been able to squeeze out two to six times more performance by kind of thinking about energy efficiency holistically by doing all the kind of things that I talked about. Right? So that's one example. So another example is uh, a paper that we had uh, which uh, we called No Power Struggles. And this has to do, again, with power management and how you design power management. And, and, and so to kind of illustrate the problem, I'm going to walk through a quick uh, uh, taxonomy of power management. Right? So you walk into a data center, and you basically say, OK, what kind of stuff do you do on power management? So you can start kind of thinking about uh, a taxonomy where there's some people who look at average power, which is the electricity you consume. Some people look at peak thermal power, which is the air conditioning that you want to provide. Some people look at peak electrical power, which is the fuse that you want to have in your data center. And people might have a few solutions deployed there. Another dimension to think about is basically at what level of the system you do stuff. Uh, you can do things at the processor level, at the server level, at the enclosure level, at the rack level, at the data center level, bunch of solutions for that. You can start thinking about what level of the software you do stuff, uh, virtualization, operating system, distributed systems, management stack, again, a bunch of solutions there. You can start adding more levels of complexity in terms of what kind of knobs you use. Do you use uh, virtual machine consolidation? Do you turn machines off? Do you use heterogeneity? What kind of metric do you optimize for? Do you optimize for performance, performance per watt, uh, energy delay, joule sort? Uh, uh, and then on top of that, you can start thinking about what you do for cooling. Right? And so uh, yeah, do I do cooling controller at the fan level, at the vent tile level, at the air conditioner level? There are equivalent controllers for performance at the processor level, at the cluster level, and power affects cooling, cooling affects performance, performance affects power. And when you put all of these things together in a data center, what you have is a big mess. Right? And so we went to uh, an example data center when we turned on five of these controllers on at the same time. And within 15 minutes, 80% of the servers went into thermal overload. The temperature went so high that the servers shut themselves down. Right? So basically, if you don't solve this problem, things can literally <coughs> explode. So you have correctness issues. You have stability issues. Things keep oscillating up and down. Uh, you have efficiency issues. Is this collection <coughs> of servers that we have here providing me the best possible savings in energy that I could have? Or am I operating at a suboptimal point? Right? And so we address this problem, and, and really it's a broader problem of how do I manage uh, uncoordinated uh, individual controllers together. And, and so we came up with, uh, and that's the second mantra that I talked about, coordination. And then in case people are wondering why I have this picture here, this is apparently a boat race in Burma, and there are 250 people on this boat, and they have to row together, otherwise they fall into the water. So it's the same problem we face here, where all the controllers for power management have to load together. Otherwise, you're going to have thermal overload. Right? So, and so this is the uh, solution we have. Uh, anybody who doesn't understand the solution, raise your hands. Oh, good. So the rest of you can explain it to them. Uh, so I, I don't intend to kind of go into detail on this. Uh, it's actually not as complicated as it looks. Uh, it's, it's actually what we started off looking at is basic uh, a feedback controller, and that's this blue box here. And you can see uh, an arrow coming back, and you look at the uh, error in the signal, and then you do some things. And then we kind of built on top of that. Right? Um, if you're interested, we can go into more detail, uh, or you can have uh, uh, somebody talk to you about that. But the interesting part is how it, it works, right? And so what I have here in this picture is basically the load on this computer. This is the amount of uh, uh, CPU you utilize. Uh, the blue line is the amount of cooling you have in the data center. If you exceed your power, things explode, right? And so this violet line here is the baseline, and the red line is after we kind of came in and improved power. Right? So you can see the violet line actually broke the promise there. So it actually generated more heat than the air conditioners could supply. And then the red line actually is lower and it, it's safer. Right? So, and then this is the bigger number. Uh, with, for a bunch of actual data center deployments, you get 65% in electricity savings, 20% in air conditioning savings, and you don't compromise performance at all. Okay? Uh, there's a bunch of other interesting insights uh, really pertaining to how you can simplify the design, and I'm not going to go into much detail on that. Uh, 
but, but what we have done so far with these two examples is to point out how between co-design and coordination, uh, you, you can get like a factor of two to five better, right? But remember, when I started, I said, we really want to make a big bank. I want to kind of save the world, and that's, I want to do 10x better, right? And, and, and so we noticed in my research that my son and I did, typically most superhero episodes, kind of, the hero doesn't win in the first place. So you kind of go 10 minutes into the thing, the good guy gets beaten up, and then he's like, uh, he gets a surge of special energy somehow, and we had to get Power Rangers in there. Uh, and so we're going to ask for help. So We are going to have an exciting discussion today on energy used by the IT infrastructure. At HP, we are committed to creating a sustainable IT ecosystem by minimizing the destruction of natural resources. This leads us to take a cradle-to-cradle -cradle view. Cradle-to-cradle -cradle view means examining the energy required in extracting material, manufacturing, operating, and recycling or reclamation of our products. My previous research has focused on reducing the energy used in running the data center. I would like us to examine how do we reduce the material in the data center. So what does the data center look like? It has rows and rows of rock. It's a material hog. It's an energy hog. Let's blow it up. We are left with lots of copper cables connecting these systems. How do we take the copper cables out of the data center? What do you think? How would you do it? I get rid of all that copper and use light beams to move the information instead. You could use lasers and photo detectors to move all that information around inside the data center. What would be the impact of using light beams? Uh, probably we can improve the efficiency by a factor of 100. Excellent. We have treated the data center as a computer, reduced the energy in operation, and we reduced the destruction of natural resources. Okay, so what you've seen so far is that I talked about disaggregation and ensemble management, and I'm going to introduce a couple more fancy-sounding words. I'm going to talk about dematerialization <coughs> and nanotechnology. And that's uh, the two people you heard talking are both uh, colleagues who work with me, and, and one of them is from mechanical engineering, and he talks about, uh, uh, he does a lot of research into thermomechanical aspects, system packaging, and so on. And the other person works on uh, nanotechnology, and he looks at uh, photonics. How do I bring optics into the system? How do I kind of come up with uh, new memory technologies and so on. So anybody here know much about photonics, optics? I noticed there is some work on Sonoma State around that. So one, okay. Okay, so I'm going to give a couple of examples and I do want to uh, finish uh, uh, so that there's time for questions. So, and typically I talk faster when I get hungrier. So uh, <laughs> I, I can finish this very fast if you're not going to interrupt. So uh, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give a couple of examples, and the first one is on uh, basically uh, dematerialized design. And, and one of the things that we started doing was to s look at exergy. Uh, instead of starting to just look at energy, uh, we're starting to focus on a new metric called exergy. And, and ex how many people here know what exergy is? Okay. So exergy is basically the amount of available energy in the system. Right? So if you take a spring and it's uh, compressed, there is a certain available energy that gets lost when you uh, uncompress the spring, right? Energy cannot be destroyed, law of conservation of energy. But the amount of exergy can be destroyed. And then so when you start looking at, uh, so again, another example is you have wood. You burn wood, you get ashes, right? Energy is not destroyed, but the amount of available energy in wood versus the amount of available energy in ashes is very different. Right? And so we spent a lot of time looking at exergy, and it turns out exergy is a very good proxy for sustainability and looking at both supply side and demand side energy. And so we did an uh, exergy space exploration of classical techniques for energy management. And what's very interesting is that uh, if you just look at energy, so this is a baseline system. These are two techniques that a lot of people uh, are currently looking at. One is called energy proportionality, and the other is called consolidation. You notice that the blue guy is better than the green guy. And that's focusing just on energy. But if you focus on exergy, the same baseline, the same two techniques, you focus the green guy is actually better than the blue guy. So the point here is that if you focus on exergy, you, you end up getting a different set of design points sometimes than if you focus on energy. And really, exergy is a more sustainable way to look at things as well. And so we looked at exergy, and we came up with a design that's uh, pretty radically different from what we have right now. 
Remember uh, the video and the previous uh, slides where we talked about how current things have a bunch of servers with a box around them. I call it a rack, right? And what we have done essentially is to break that uh, material uh, boundary. And this new data center has just a spine. And, and, and all the blades, all the motherboards, just go attached to the spine. So what you have here is a data center which is very dematerialized. Mm -hmm. And by dematerializing this data center, uh, you have a lot of interesting advantages in terms of the exergy of the materials involved, the amount of energy to make all the materials. But also you have a bunch of advantages in terms of how the airflow goes and the impedances for the airflow with the material and so on. And the good news is once you do all of these things together, so your baseline consumed so much energy, your new system consumes significantly lower energy, a factor of two uh, better uh, in terms of the uh, energy consumed. And once again, you can see that there's a lot of different components. And to get a factor of two, I, I, I couldn't have just picked one and done that. I really needed to look at this holistic design to uh, uh, improve what I consider. Right? And then the good news, again, is that 2x better is over some pretty aggressive baselines. And so we are pretty excited about what this means for uh, future research on power management devices as well. So the last thing I want to do is we can do even better. Right? And, and, and so I'm going to talk about one very simple uh, uh, idea around what we call exergy-optimized data-centric architectures. And, and so why data-centric? Uh, data is one of the biggest trends in computer science. Right? More data is going to be created in the next four years than ever before. And if you look at Google, they had five exabytes in 2002, and they went to close to 300 exabytes in 2009. That's a factor of 56x in seven years. And if you look at Moore's law, that's a factor of 16. Right? And it's the same thing with other data as well. If you look at uh, uh, data is growing at a certain rate, Moore's law is growing at a certain rate. So we basically have data growth at a faster exponential than Moore's law. Right? And, and then if you look at how do you optimize for data, if you look at traditional architectures. So how many people have taken a computer architecture course, a computer organization course? A few people? OK. So one of the things you will find <coughs> in computer designs, if you open up your laptop or your PC, you will find there's something called a hierarchy, right? which is basically uh, uh, to go to data in your disk, you have other levels that you go to before. You have memory, you have caches, and multiple levels of caches. But the problem with caches is they take a lot of material, and at some point they take more power than the benefits they give. And, uh, and this is basically a picture that shows that for a given data, you're starting to add more and more caches because you need to kind of get things more and more closer. What is very interesting is uh, there's also some technology trends that are kind of uh, uh, starting to change things. And one of them is called the Memristor. And so Memristor was actually uh, uh, something that uh, HP Labs has been spending a lot of time on. And in 1971, uh, a researcher at Berkeley postulated the existence of a fourth element. There's resistance, capacitance, inductance. And just the math of how this works, there is a fourth missing element called a memristance. And, 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 and we haven't been able to find a memristor till very recently when we started operating at the nanotechnology level. And, and, and so uh, uh, at HP Labs, uh, we actually have working prototypes of a memristor and, and, and a lot of interesting uh, uh, properties around that. But what's very interesting around memristors is they offer the potential for non-volatile storage. Right? So how many people have used a USB uh, memory device before? Right? Almost everybody here. And, and that's the kind of non-volatility we are talking about, except the memristor is way more faster, lasts longer, and is more energy efficient. Right? So we have a technology that can pretty much disrupt the assumptions around how we've been designing systems. And then on top of that, there's a bunch of other interesting things happening in computer architecture around photonics and around uh, uh, simpler processors. And when you put them together, we came up with a very interesting, uh, radically new computer architecture for how you design systems. And uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you'll, you'll see that it's a pretty interesting uh, architecture. And uh, you can come talk to me there. But that's kind of how you uh, uh, get to kind of uh, the benefits you want. And, uh, and what is very interesting is if you look at the actual limits of Feynman, right? if you go do the math, you can have one billion Pentiums in the power of one handheld. And so we have, we have come nowhere close to kind of getting to the potential of what we want. And, and there's a lot more that we could be doing. And, uh, and, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to leave you with. right? So basically, there are some very interesting challenges around energy management, around sustainability. And if you take back a couple of messages from this talk, it's about systematic uh, understanding the principles of power management. It's about holistic designs around uh, uh, coordinated co-design stuff. 
and there's a lot more stuff that you should do. So next time I come here, I want a lot more people saying, uh, here are cute stuff that we did, and uh, hopefully you can all improve things a little bit better. I had to get incredible sense. So, and, and so I know you guys are students, and you may not be as motivated by uh, saving the world and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, it actually turns out you can make a lot of money by kind of working on power management. Uh, don't look at me. So, but, uh, but, but the point is, and if money doesn't matter, uh, I hear you can win a few awards for working in this space. So thank you very much. have time for Q&A questions? Yeah. Uh, work on, on recycling the heat energy by, uh, the uh, it, it turns out that the amount of available energy, that's why exergy is a very interesting metric, the amount of available energy from the heat and servers is not enough to actually do useful stuff. But there are people starting to look at harvesting that energy to run sensors, do a bunch of stuff. Uh, you'll also see people talking about co-locating power generation with uh, data centers. And it turns out that there is a lot of harvesting that you can do there, and that's more promising. That's a very good question. Had all the components exposed like that with your supply design order? Mm -hmm. um, does that make a big difference as far as keeping the data center insulated from dust and stuff? That's, again, a good question. So there are two things. There's dust, which isn't usually a problem. There is EMI, which is the electromagnetic interference. And it turns out, uh, with the right uh, uh, sensible design, it's not a problem as well. Good questions. This site has been very silent so far. OK. Thank you very much.